It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. And as always, the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network is brought to you by our good friends at Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. We have put the college basketball season to bed, and as we expected, it is UConn that proves that they are right now a college basketball dynasty. And I think you can make the case, and I was making it this morning, that they have been in the NCAA tournament over the last two years, 12 games, covering 12 games, winning all 12 games by double digits with their 75-60 win tonight. They have been the most dominant team since the great UCLA teams that completely dominated the sport with Lou Alcinda, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Wicks and Rowe and Patterson, and then the great Bill Walton. Um, that's how dominant they have been. They were more dominant than UNLV. They were more dominant than Duke. They were more dominant than Florida that went back-to-back. This team that really did not have a weakness, and I told you this morning, we expected Edie to score. We thought there was a very good chance he could get the bigs in foul trouble. Klingon had uh, three. Uh, Johnson fouled out. Klingon wound up with four. Excuse me, he got his fourth. And Johnson fouled out, but it didn't make a, it didn't make a difference. As I said, to you, if UConn was if Purdue was going to pull off the upset, three things had to happen. They had to keep their turnovers down, and. They really didn't keep their turnovers down. Uh, borderline, but still some sloppy play. They had to hit threes. They hit one in the game. And they had to get to the foul line a lot. They did not. They got to the foul line 15 times. UConn got to the foul line 11 times. UConn made six threes. Purdue made one three. It cannot work that way because they out-rebounded them. They yeah, rebound them on the offensive glass, and this is what we knew. Purdue was a very weak defensive team on the perimeter. They did not have the athleticism or the size to deal with the, Purdue, the UConn guards, and the UConn backcourt outscored the Purdue backcourt 55-17, to 17. and that made up for the fact that Edie outscored Klingon 37 to 11. Now, Edie wound up with 37 points and 10 rebounds. He did not play well. He had a very good first five minutes. He had a great first five minutes. He had a good first 10 minutes. He seemed to get tired with the physicality and the attacking that UConn did. Attacking on defense, attacking the rim. I think he got tired. I really do. He came out of the game for 33 seconds. They had to rush him back in because they were losing control. But he seemed tired at the end of the first half and at times in the second half. I think this game with the physicality and the athleticism of UConn was too much for Edie. And I'm going to be honest with you. This game changed from 23-23 in the first half. There was seven minutes left In the first half, it was 23 up. And Purdue, when they went to a break, I said, Purdue has to be very happy with where things are. I said, I don't think UConn is overly concerned, but I think Purdue's happy. There were seven minutes left. Edie did not score again in the first half. Purdue wound up with a six-point lead. You heard Jay Wright say at halftime a very, very big thing, and it didn't happen. He said the Purdue guards have got to get to the three-point line and make threes rather than drive it to the basket. It's not their game. They didn't ever do that. They never hurt UConn from three. They made one three in the game, and Edie had a lot of trouble in the first part of the game. He had trouble with Johnson's quickness. Johnson got a couple of big lobs when they broke the game open. He had trouble with Klingon. Klingon did a very nice job on him in the middle part of the game. He did a wonderful job on him defensively. And Edie got a lot of late points that made the stat sheet sing. 
He wound up with 37 points, 10 rebounds. Say, wait, what are you talking about? He had a great game. He didn't. He didn't even have a good game. Not for him. Because he did not in any way impact the game. His points were an add-on. The game was over. And this game was over 10 minutes into the second half. Because with about 13 minutes left, Johnson had four and Klingon had three. And I said, if they can get the ball to Edie and he can get them in serious foul trouble, they can maybe make this a real finish. It never happened. Their guards never made shots. When UConn got to double digits, this game was over because Purdue could not handle them on the perimeter. They could not handle them going to the basket. They could not handle their athleticism. They could not handle their ability to play the shot clock, and then make a big play at the end, whether it was Newton making a play on a drive or Newton making a three or Spencer making play after play after play. Newton wound up with 20. Castle wound up with 15. Spencer wound up with 11 and eight rebounds, and he was a thorn in Purdue's side all night. He made play after play. Klingon had none at the half. I mean, Klingon wound up with 11 points. Caravan made some big plays, although we didn't score much tonight. The bottom line is this game was over with 10 minutes left. UConn was toying with them. They had their double-digit lead, and when they got their double-digit lead, the game was over. That was it. They got their double-digit lead with 10 minutes left, and the game was over. You were just toying with the game from there. Was it going to be 20 points? Was it going to be 15 points? And let's be honest, if UConn didn't get sloppy with the ball for a couple of minutes there, where they turned it over, uh, they, uh, Danny got called for a uh, – he was out of the box. They, if not for some turnovers of possessions there and, some, and letting them score some easy baskets – game wouldn't have been as close as it was. It wound up 75-60. They just couldn't handle the size, the athleticism, the overall play of UConn's perimeter just destroyed Purdue's perimeter. And Klingon did a nice job, and their defense did a nice job on Edie, and Purdue had no answers in the second half. They were a done team with 10 minutes left in the game, and then the game basically was 10 minutes of boring time because you just had one question. If you, if you bet Purdue, you were hoping they would get a couple of late threes and cover. If not, you were wondering whether UConn would cover, and of course UConn did because that's what they always do. They always win by double digits, and they always cover the point spread as they did again here. And again, they've had one of the remarkable runs in the history Now, I'm going to tell you this right now, and I know nothing about it. I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's happening. I, you know, I I don't get involved in what what coaches' movement anymore or anything like that. When they move, that's fine. I'll react to it when it happens. Um, Those days are over. Now, a lot of people are saying that Kentucky is going to make a huge run at Hurley. I'm just going by what I know about the Hurley family, who I have known forever. I know their father forever. And I don't see him comfortable as a Kentucky coach. It's not their image it would surprise me radically. He has built something special at UConn. He has, done, he has done something. He's actually topped what Jim Calhoun did, and I didn't think that was even humanly possible. Jim Calhoun built the UConn program from nothing into a powerhouse. And the fact what they've done I was a big advocate of them going back into the Big East. I thought it was a perfect fit, but I never expected them to replace Villanova as the force. 
and not only that, taking it to a different level. They haven't just been a champion. They have been a absolute tsunami. They have just destroyed teams. What they've done the last two years is historic. It will rank with, you know, it'll rank with the great teams in the history of college basketball. And Danny Hurley, who comes from a basketball family, his father was a legendary high school coach, one of the legendary high school coaches ever. And Bobby Hurley had a brilliant career as a player, cut short by an accident in the pros, but as a collegian, a brilliant career. And Danny lived in the shadow of Bobby's brilliant career. And now Danny has staked his own claim and become a giant of a basketball coach. Does he act up too much on the sideline? Yes. Does, is he relentless with his, you know, yes, he's very passionate, but does he react to too many calls? Yes, he does. But you know what? Hey, nobody's perfect. What he does is win. And he took a team that won last year and won going away. And they were more dominant this year. Spencer was a perfect fit. Went going and get a freshman like Castle, who will be a lottery pick. Klingon will be a lottery pick. Castle will be a lottery pick. And I don't know if Castle's going out this year. He's only a freshman. But when he goes out, he's a lottery pick. He's that talented. He is a brilliant talent. He has all-star, NBA all-star written all over him. If he keeps working and does what he has to do, he's that kind of talent. He's got everything. Physical. He's got everything. Great defender. Great quickness. He'll get better shooting the ball. He's dynamic. Absolutely dynamic. So this was a great win for UConn. Now, again, I would be stunned. I have to admit, I've made, I tried to make this point this morning. It takes a certain personality to be at Kentucky. It's not for every coach. Is it a special job? Absolutely. Is it a dream job? Yeah. And the old idea that nobody turns Kentucky down is nonsense because people have turned Kentucky down. There's no question people turn Kentucky down the last three days or two days or today. I don't know. I told you, the guy who is a perfect fit from a standpoint of being the person who can handle all the facets of the Kentucky job is Billy Donovan. I don't know what Billy Donovan wants to do. I have no idea. But he would be the right fit. I don't, I'm going to say this now. If I'm dead wrong and Danny Hurley takes this job, and I'm not saying he won't be offered it, I would think he won't take it. If he takes it, and I like Danny a lot personally. I like the family. I like Danny. I've known Danny a long time. I will say that Danny will rue the day he took the job because he's not going to like it there. It's not, it doesn't fit who he is. And he, he doesn't need to go there to win. He doesn't need to go there to get, to, to get players. UConn has been winning for the last 25 years. Kentucky hasn't. Kentucky's won a lot, but they haven't won championships. They won a championship in, in the 90s with Patino, and they won a championship with Calipari. Won. They won a championship with Tubby. I mean, you know, most of their coaches win a championship. But they haven't been like UConn. I mean, UConn's won six championships. So money, I don't think, will drive him there. UConn's going to take great care of him. He's already making a lot of money. He'll make more. I don't think money will motivate him. I don't think it's a good fit. 
And I would be very surprised if his father was on board of him going to Kentucky. Really surprised. It just doesn't fit their image. Now, let's see what happens. And I don't know anything. I haven't talked to anybody. I don't have any clue. I didn't know Calipari, who I've known forever, was going. Am I surprised John left? No. I know John was miserable at Kentucky. And they didn't want him there. But they were not going to, as I told you, the day people were saying he was going to get fired after the Oakland job, I told you he wasn't going to get fired because they would have had to pay him $33 million to fire him. They were not going to do that. John has more money than what to do with. But he hobnobs with big boosters like Tyson. The AD and Tyson were very much involved in this. Arkansas has great facilities, great fans, plenty of money. And can he win there? Absolutely. Arkansas has won big before. They can win there. Absolutely. Can they win a national championship? Can John win a national championship at Arkansas? Absolutely. John will bring players in no matter where he is. If you put John anywhere in the country, he's going to build a top 10 team. I mean, that's just the way who he, that's just who he is. Now, the getting the freshmen and playing the freshmen and going the one and done route and, and trying to build that way, that's over because you can't do that in an NIL world because you're playing against grad students on these teams. These guys come into ready made teams and they're grad students. They come in for one year to try and win a championship. Those guys are five years older than those freshmen. You can't win with a bunch of freshmen anymore, no matter how talented they are, because they have given up five years of experience. You have to use the portal to get players. And the way you do it is you get guys who had good careers at other schools, especially mid-majors or lower majors. You take a great player off those teams who's had a big run there, and he goes to grad school at your school for one year, and he gives you a huge season. That's where they all get these players from. And that's not going to change. But the story tonight is UConn. They completed what they started. I told you in January, I thought they'd win the whole thing. I told you in February when I came back from the St. John's game that I went to, that I I, uh, went to with Harrison on uh, February 1st. I came back after seeing them in person, had an interesting talk with one of their assistants, Tom Moore, that day. He told me what Castle was going to do the rest of the season. He said, watch, we are going to unleash Castle here, and we're going to be a different team when we do, and they did. He was dead on, and he said, wait until you see how good this guy is, and he was dead on. When I saw them in person, I didn't think anybody could beat them. And I had that thought throughout the whole NCAA tournament, and it turned out to be true. They were that good. It was not a great NCAA tournament. It was dominated by the big teams. Purdue dominated all the way to the championship game. Kentucky, uh, I mean, uh, UConn dominated the entire time. You know, there have been NCAA tournaments that had three seeded teams upset within 12 minutes on last second shots. That's the charm of the tournament. We didn't have any of that this year. We didn't have buzzer beaters. We didn't have Cinderella's. We had, you know, we had Oakland knocking out Kentucky and starting this. But remember, this chain of events started because SMU fired their coach, which had the USC coach jump to SMU and the Arkansas coach jump to USC, which opened up Arkansas for an unhappy Calipari. And now we'll see who winds up. Oates, it sounds like, is not going from Alabama to Kentucky. I would watch the Baylor coach. I would watch Billy Donovan. Um, those are the thing. Those are the two that come to my the top of my head right now. And listen, I understand that Hurley's the hot, you know, he's the flavor. Jay Wright's not coaching, so you forget that. Forget that. He's the flavor. But 
I just don't see him going there. I, I admit I will be very – I don't know anything, but I will be very, very surprised if he goes there. I just don't think it fits who they are as a family. We'll see. So congratulations to Danny. Congratulations to the UConn players. They had a brilliant year. They're one of the great teams at all time. Uh, they earned this championship back-to-back. Great performance. And now we can think about winning three in a row. Want to do something really difficult? Try that one on. Try to win three in a row. It gets tougher with each passing year. Remember, the Masters, right around the corner, starts Thursday. We'll have wall-to-wall coverage, so watch for that. We'll see you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. 